Well, good afternoon to you all. Uh, thanks for having me here to speak to you. Um, when I was given this title for this address, uh, the meaning behind hymns, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise, um, I was very intrigued. I've not been given a subject like that to, to speak about before. Um, perhaps didn't know about my lack of any musical talent or ability. Um, but the great thing is, to enjoy hymns and the meaning behind hymns and appreciate them, you don't have to have great musical ability. Um, you just need to read the words, think about what they mean and what they teach us. Um, thankfully, we're well blessed with people who can play the organ in such a lovely way, um, people around us who can sing and carry us along um, that might not sound so great by ourselves. Um, so we can all enjoy these things. Um, and thank you for a beautiful rendition uh, that was just all sung together. And you can tell by the sort of the rise and fall of the way people sing it, how they, they, they mean the things that they're, they're singing, which is great. Um, so the hymn we're going to look at this afternoon is that hymn 94, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Um, so what's, what's this hymn all about and what, what can we learn from it? And I think it is important to think about the meaning of hymns as we may well be singing them for a number of reasons, uh, perhaps in praise or thanksgiving, in reflection. Um, I'm sure we all, if, if we uh, have our Christelphian hymn books, we may well have our favourite hymns, um, things that rouse certain feelings in us, ones that we can remember well or perhaps have associated with certain memories. Um, sometimes when you're a presiding brother, it's really hard not to come back to the same hymns every time because you think, oh, I really like that one, or I'll put that one in again. Um, but hymns and, and singing of hymns and the rhythm of them is a really great way to remember things as well. Um, the melody can, can help you to remember the words. Um, but of course, it's really important to understand the meanings of those hymns or they become of little effect. Um, and we can't really sing them with the emotion or the substance that they deserve. Um, I think they, they raise a lot of emotion. I, I remember my mother telling me about one of the hymns, Hymn 415, which is the day thou gavest, Lord, is ended. Um, it has, well, we're not going to digress into doing more than one hymn, but this was uh, before I was baptised, actually, and now I was spending some time in New Zealand, so about as far away as you could possibly get. Um, and in Hymn 415, it, it just talks about the day, the sun setting. Um, I forget the words now, just saying I like it. The day that gave us Lord is ended, and it says, As over each continent and island, the dawn leads on another day. The voice of prayer is never silent, nor dies the strain of praise away. The sun that bids us rest is waking our brethren beneath the western sky. She said every time she would sing that, she'd think about what I was doing or what I was up to on the other side of the world. Um, so I've always remembered that, and actually, when I sing it now, it always brings a, a, a tear to my eye. Um, I find it quite difficult to talk about, actually, so we'll, we'll move on. Um, <laughs> so we'll, we'll concentrate on our hymn for this afternoon, which is hymn, uh, hymn 94. And I was saying before about how singing of hymns is quite a, a good way to remember things. Um, I remember speaking to someone who was brought up that they said they were worried that in the future we might have a very oppressive government who would uh, or will be taken over by foreign invaders, whatever it was, take away their ability or uh, legal um, freedoms to read the Bible and actually have no access to any of these things. Yet if they learnt these hymns by heart, then that would be fresh in their mind. So even if people took away the way the means of reading these things, they'd be able to um, go through them in their mind, which was an interesting thought as well. Um, so our, our hymn 94... And I always find it useful if I'm, if I'm preparing something or if I'm presiding. They have these nice, helpful uh, things at the top, titles at the top of your page. If you've got it in front of you, it'll say, God, praise. So it really sums it up for us there. This hymn is about praising God. So who is God? Well, if we look at our first line there. It says, immortal, invisible, God only wise. There were words that we had in our opening reading in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Sometimes when you're reading them, that, that hymn's going through, through your head and you're almost singing the, the, the thing as you, as you go through. Um, so it's saying here that God is immortal. 
So is this in keeping with the scriptures, what the Bible says? Well, the Bible, we believe, is the inspired word of God. And that's what it says it is. And that's what we believe it is. These hymns aren't composed by inspiration, direct inspiration from God, like the Bible is. But they're written by people who've read the, the scriptures and are interpreting them and putting those words into these, these hymns that we have. Um, and this theme about immortal invisible God only wise it's actually continued later in Timothy so we read 1 Timothy chapter 1 uh, as an introduction um, but if you look in 1 Timothy chapter 6 what we're going to do this afternoon is just turn up a few passages turn with them if you like or I will read them out so don't worry if you don't want to you want to just sit back and listen um, I just try to think where some of these words have come from, from Scripture. And in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 13, um, it says, I give thee charge in the sight of God, who quickeneth all things, and before Christ Jesus, who before Pontius Pilate witnessed a good confession, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ which in his times he shall show who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who only hath immortality, dwelling in the light which no man can approach unto, whom no man hath seen nor can see, to whom be honour and power everlasting. Amen. If you don't read this passage carefully and thoughtfully, it might appear um, that it is calling Jesus immortal. But it isn't. It's a bit of a different subject. Um, but we believe that the Bible says that Jesus is the Son of God, the two separate entities. This passage is talking about God as the only being who has immortality. It says, no man has seen or can see. So that rules out Jesus, as we read about people who saw Jesus and conversed with him face to face. Um, so actually, this passage is telling us on one side actually that God and Jesus cannot be the same only God has immortality and he cannot be seen dwelling in this light now Jesus manifested God's character um, why does it say though only that God has immortality is Jesus after his death and uh, resurrection is he not now immortal well Jesus is going to live forever and God will also exist forever, but he has no beginning either, so he's truly immortal. He has always existed and always will exist. Um, in Psalm chapter 90, and verse 2, um, I'll just turn to that. We'll start in verse 1. It says, Psalm 90, um, Lord, Thou hast been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever thou hast formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. From everlasting to everlasting, so that's the um, existence of God. So we know that God is immortal. So immortal, invisible, God only wise. Is God invisible? Well, yes, we can't see God directly. Um, we read that in our Timothy passage just before, and we do read about various people meeting God, such as Moses. However, nobody ever sees God's um, face. It does sometimes say that God spoke with someone face to face, but this just means directly, or, or could be referring through a proxy like the angels, or in fact that people were in the presence of God, surrounded by a cloud, without actually being able to see him. But although he's invisible to our eyes, we can see his character by the wonder of his creation around us and also by what we read in our Bibles and what um, his son Jesus did in the world. If we turn to another reference in John 14. nine well start in verse eight it says philip saith unto him lord show us the father and it sufficeth us and jesus saith unto him have i been 
so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. And how sayest thou then, show us the Father? Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me? The words that I speak unto you I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doeth the works. So Jesus was, Jesus was born a man, we know he suffered temptation like a man, but he overcame. In his life he displayed the characteristics of God. So we can't see God directly, but we can see his character, merciful, gracious, slow to anger and loving. You might be thinking, well, I've spent 10 minutes on two words of our hymn, so I'll calculate it out and see how long he's going to speak for. Don't worry, <laughs> I'll be speeding up a little bit. Um, so we've got the character of God there, mortal, invisible, God only wise. Let's turn to another, another verse in James. One of my favourite books, James, um, if you can have favourites. Um, I think it's quite condensed, lots of practical uh, practical exhortation for us, encouragement and uh, so on. But James chapter 3, verse, and we'll start in verse 13. It says, Who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Let him show out of a good conversation his works with meekness of wisdom, but if you have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, devilish. For where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. We can see there's a difference here between man's wisdom and God's wisdom. There's a, there's a contrast and a lesson for us all in the way that we live our lives. We can often strive to gain man's wisdom. We like to work things out for ourselves. We often don't understand the bigger picture that God has, knowing how all things are going to work out, he knows, beginning from the end. We often trust in our own wisdom rather than humble ourselves before God and bowing to his incomparable oversight and understanding. Our second line of our hymn, in, in light inaccessible hid from our eyes. Well, that's a continuation of our theme before about not being able to see God. Um, the third line, most blessed, most glorious, the ancient of days. So the Ancient of Days is a title used in the, in the Bible in the prophecy of Daniel in chapter 7 and verse 9. And it's a vision of, of heaven. Now, Daniel's not actually seeing God, he's seeing a vision. Um, but what does that mean though, the Ancient of Days? Well, I think it means that God existed before days existed. We read in Genesis, or we read in Genesis, that God created the sun, the moon and the stars. He created day and night uh, and seasons. So before time as we know it and understand it, um, and before that existed, God existed. Isaiah 43 verse 13 says, Yea, before the day was, I am he. So God, God, God is immortal, invisible, only wise um, from before uh, days began, um, most blessed, most glorious. Almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. So this, this first verse tells us that God is the almighty creator of the world. Immortal, with no beginning, no end. We are unable to see him, but we see his character manifested in his creation and in his word and in his son. This is bigger and more awesome than we can comprehend. So of course, he is absolutely worthy of all praise and glory and honour. So moving on to the second verse, this tells us a bit more about the character um, of God. Unresting, unhasting, and silent as light, nor wanting, nor wasting, thou rulest in might. Thy justice like mountains high soaring above, thy clouds which are fountains of goodness and love. God rules over everything. 
Yet he does not speak directly to us other than through his word and through the actions of uh, his, his son. We turn to Hebrews chapter 1, just before James. Hebrews chapter 1, in the first three verses there, it says, God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Thou rulest in might. Um, let's turn to Isaiah for this. Um, Isaiah chapter 45. And we'll start in verse 5. It says there, I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I go to thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. I form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. God rules over everything, the whole of creation. Everything is under his control. Justice like mountains. Well, let's turn to another verse. We'll look at Psalm 89. Again, you could pick loads of different verses to, to demonstrate a lot of these principles. Um, Psalm 89, verse 14. Justice and judgment are the habitation of thy throne. Mercy and truth shall go before thy face. So the justice like mountains. Thy clouds which are fountains of goodness and love. From above in the clouds is where we, we tend to sort of metaphorically think where, where God is. Um, we'll, we'll go back to James for this one. James chapter 1. Um, James chapter 1 and verse 17 it says there every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the father of lights with whom is no variableness neither shadow of turning God sustains all life. And when all these good things happen, we can consider them blessings from God. It's very easy to take things for granted, uh, but we always need to be ready to remember who is in control and how we don't achieve things for ourselves. Rather, we use the skills um, that, or the things that we have been given by God. Um, We'll move on to the third verse. To all life thou givest, to both great and small, in all life thou livest, the true life of all. We blossom and flourish as leaves on the tree, and wither and perish, but naught changeth thee. We see here that God gives all life. Uh, we know from Genesis that God made the universe and the earth that we live on. Um, he breathed life into Adam. But it didn't end there. He still does sustain all life. Um, Job chapter 12 verse 10 it says in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind uh, we'll turn to another psalm psalm 104 you could read the whole chapter but we won't um, we'll just start at the beginning psalm 104 Bless the Lord, O my soul, O Lord my God, thou art very great. Thou art clothed with honour and majesty, who coverest thyself with light as with a garment, who stretchest out the heavens like a curtain, who layeth the beams of his chambers in the waters, who maketh the cloud his chariot, who walketh upon the wings of the wind, who maketh his angel spirits, his ministers a flaming fire, who laid the foundations of the earth that it should not be removed for ever. Thou coverest it with a deep as with a garment, the water stood above the mountains and, and and so on. Um, 
pick it up again in verse 24. O Lord, how manifold are thy works. In wisdom hast thou made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. So is this great and wide sea, wherein are things creeping innumerable, both small and great beasts. There go the ships, there is that Leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein. These wait all upon thee, that thou mayest give them their meat in due season. That thou givest them they gather, thou openest thine hand, they are filled with good. Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, they die, and return to the dust. Thou sendeth forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. The glory of the Lord shall endure forever, the Lord shall rejoice in his works. He looketh on the earth, and it trembleth. He toucheth the hills, and they smoke. I will sing unto the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have my being. My meditation of him shall be sweet. I will be glad in the Lord. Really beautiful words. God's spirit continues to keep the earth and its ecosystems and the inhabitants on it alive. Again, we take this for granted when we wake up every morning. The breath in our body, the plants, the animals that we see around us, everything. How much more could we emphasise that how worthy is God of all our praise, our adoration, our love and our devotion? We blossom and flourish as leaves on the tree and wither and perish. We'll go back to James again. Apologies, we're backwards and forwards a little bit. but uh, It's a good exercise. James chapter 4, verse 13. Go to now, ye that say, today or tomorrow we will go into such a city, and continue there a year, and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapour that appeareth for a little time, and then vanisheth away. We blossom and flourish as leaves on this tree and wither and perish. What is your life? It is even a vapour. We are like the plants. We are born, we grow, we have this temporary life. God never changes. He is the one constant thing in our lives. He promises salvation to those who love him, to follow his commandments and are baptised into the saving name of his son. So many things in our lives are temporary or change easily where we live our jobs, our health our relationships we tend to think that these things will go on forever but it's not the case suddenly any of these things can be taken away but God or our faith they can't be taken away um, look at Romans chapter 8 a lot of uncertainty in various things in the world but this is what's before us and our relationship with God this is the one thing that we need to hold on to Romans 8 verse 38 for I'm persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord in Isaiah 40, verse 8, it says, The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of our God will stand forever. Also think of that verse we've already looked at in James chapter 1, where it says, There is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. God is constant. His message is consistent from beginning to the end. The Bible doesn't contradict itself. God's character and his plan for the world is consistent. There's no variableness or shadow of turning. Well, what's that? If you have a static object, it's always going to cast a shadow in one direction, depending on where the, the light, the source of light's coming from, depending on the time of day or, or whatever the source of light may be. God is in control of all these things, and he resides in heaven in an inapproachable light. There is no shadow cast. We'll move on to um, the final verse in verse 4. Great Father of glory, pure Father of light, thine angels adore thee, unveiled is their sight. O oh Lord, we would render, O oh help us to see, it is only the splendour of light hideth thee. You see this name there, Father of Light, that we saw in that James reading, Father of Lights. 
and angels adore thee, and veiled is their sight. The angels are God's servants or messengers. They are able to see him, unlike us. Uh, the angels are not flesh and blood like us, despite appearing to people in the past, looking and having the appearance of, of men. O oh Lord, we would render, or oh help us to see. Well, Lord means to praise. So all praise we would give to God. It is only the splendour of light that hide thee. We cannot see God, as we mentioned before, but, but in the future these things are going to change. This, this hymn is all about the nature of God, the almighty creator and sustainer of everything we see. He rules over the heavens and the earth. He's adored by the angels and so too should be by us. When we sing this hymn, we should sing it with these things in our minds, knowing that he is worthy of all praise and honour and glory. But he is invisible, and that can be the problem for some people. It might be why some people struggle to believe in his existence or to worship him. And that's where faith comes in. Hebrews 11 defines faith as the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We can't see God, so we, we need faith that he exists. It is in the same chapter of, of Hebrews um, that says that without faith it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is, or rather that he exists, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. So you may have sung this hum, hymn a hundred times. If you have, don't forget how meaningful the words are. You may just be coming to it for the first time. It just gives an outline of the incredible nature of God. Get to know him by reading the Bible. See the wonder of his creation around you. And what is the reward of those who diligently seek him? Well, the Bible tells us. It says, I hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Thank you.